How was the response in the um, I was satisfied with it. Um, it's uh, relatively, you know, new plateau in terms of sales. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know the rest of the company was, uh, was more or less satisfied. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's not the down runaway hits, you know, that every it wasn't thriller. But in it's not Millie Vanilli. No, it's not Millie Vanilli, but then I did my own singing on it, so uh, <laughs> that's probably what kept it back. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, I was satisfied with the album from a conceptual standpoint, of course, before I released it, or else I wouldn't have put it out. So, <laughs> so from that standpoint, it's fine. And then it's been, uh, it's been a, a lot of fun um, doing the album live, you know, having, a, having a big band and you know, all your great players. And, and, uh, and a bunch of swell guys, you know, all crammed into one bus. <laughs> it's something else. But, uh, yeah, we've been having a good time with uh, you know, playing behind the record. Um, it uh, it might have been a little more successful here if the uh, if the record company had not uh, been so strange about it. Uh, mm -hmm. It had to do with the album art. Um, in the American version, there's six fingers on the hands on the cover, and in the Japanese version, there's five fingers on the hands. Hmm. Go figure, you know. <laughs> but they insisted on five fingers. Maybe that's something to do with the end dollar rate. Yeah, it's something like that, you know, <laughs> exchange rate. You know. Tax me a finger. <laughs> but, uh, Let me get some answers. Okay, yeah. It lived up to your expectations in terms of sales. Then, I never have sales expectations. Mm -hmm. I don't, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but I don't make records to sell them. <laughs> I, I make records to satisfy myself and the audience that I know I have. You know, I, mean, I know there are a certain number of people who listen to the records and uh, and will um, make the commitment to try and figure out what's going on in there. You know, but uh, aside from that, I never had expectations of uh, you know of uh, having the sudden breakthrough to the you know common audience. And and I'm always a little apprehensive about what you know what that entails anyway. I mean, I was, I have been more popular and it, and there's, uh, there are these other pressures that are not, uh, at this late stage in my life, not really what I'm looking for. You know, I'm not looking to have, uh, um, National Enquirer, um, print, uh, that, that I, uh, farted in public, you know, or that, uh, you know, or, or to have my uh, have myself and my family be hassled by idle onlookers, you know, and things like that. You know, the good thing about my audience is that they have an understanding of, of me personally as well, and that and that they realize that I do this for the musical satisfaction of it, not because I want to be a personality. And uh, and that's more or less the way I like it. If I did sell a lot of records, I have to find a way to deal with it, but it's never an objective. Yeah. In the last interview you said that uh, you wanted to make something more natural and antithesis uh, to all of the, uh, the synthet synthetic sound and music in the way. Mm -hmm. Do you think you achieved that goal with your music? Mm, I hope so. I mean, I, I did to my satisfaction. We didn't use a sequencer in the entire record, so that was... Uh, um, there was there was that objective. Um, I suppose that um, it really depends on uh, on uh, any one listener's response. You know whether it's uh, whether it's accomplished its goals, whether it makes any difference to them or not. Uh, I don't think it's uh, as radical an approach for me as it might be for some other artists, like perhaps Sonic Youth. You know because. Uh, I've always striven for a certain degree of performance, no matter what, uh, no matter what the concept is, whether I'm playing it all myself or whether other musicians are involved. Um, that's partially because I really don't enjoy programming machines. I don't enjoy te I enjoy teaching another musician how to play. I don't enjoy teaching a machine how to play. Um, 
I avoided at all possible costs, so I was never inclined to do that to any great degree anyway. Drum machine is about it, you know, programming drum in there, but everything else I try and play live. Um, even if it's with a degree of incompetence, it's more important to me to, to embody some kind of uniqueness of performance in the, in the, uh, in the final product and to, uh, and to be, quote, perfect. That uh, <coughs> taking this large fan on the road, just uh, doing a tour version of the other humans, mm -hmm. and then taking it on the road, he imagines that uh, working with that many good musicians allows for a greater flow of ideas. In a strictly musical sense, um, in the same way that an orchestra doesn't get together and all compose a tune, you know, that somebody has to. To so take the musical, take the responsibility for uh, uh, for laying down the, the rules, the guidelines. Um, but beyond that, everyone is is free to uh, to explore um, different ways of expressing what the, what we agree is the essential idea. Um, and I think from night to night, you know, that happens. Some nights it gets so you know. Like a little hairy, but uh, it's what makes the uh, show continually enjoyable to do. You know? hairy. Um, well, every once in a while, somebody will decide, you know, that uh, uh, somebody might get a little too excited, or you know, or decide that they're uh, um, they're on the verge of. Uh, of uh, Becoming a solo artist right there in the middle of the show, you know. That happens. Yeah. Well, you know, it can. It can happen. You know, somebody will start to. Uh, it happens. You know, we have everybody sings in the band, you know? mm -hmm. and there's a difference between singing like a background singer and singing like a lead singer. Uh, you know, so well, you know. Much melisma there. Yeah, something like that. You know, somebody might start getting a little bit too. You know, I'm supposed to do the noodling around. You know, they're just supposed to hit the notes. You know, so. Uh, so essentially the approach is you kind of plug in all the musicians <coughs> and you have them play what you want to play as opposed to allowing them that much slack on stage? Well, this, it's not like Frank Zappa, you know. Frank Zappa, uh, there might be a lot of extemporaneous stuff going on, but we play a fairly, uh, fairly tight arrangement. But within that, you know, there is uh, there's a lot of opportunity for people to solo, uh, um, the dynamic of things may vary from night to night. You know, something that was uh, particularly loud one night that night might be less so another night. And uh, and uh, and we, we what we ultimately try and do is uh, is I think uh, uh, play sort of musical whispering down the lane. You know, whereas uh, whereas uh, I will have to kind of set the tone for what happens and and they have to try and figure out what that is you know and once they figure out what that is then they are uh, then they use their own discretion in terms of playing along with it you know and then also there are smaller interactions going on between the, you know the bass or player and the drummer you know the rhythm section or the guitar player and the keyboard players and things like that so there are always these little you know eddies and whirls of Stuff going on within the uh, uh, within the performance, but it's not as if uh, the drummer can suddenly decide, okay, we're going we're, we're going to bash the shit out of it right here. You know, he doesn't. Uh, uh, if there was that much freedom, you know, throughout, then it would just it would probably be a disastrous mess, you know, because uh, because it's not supposed to be a, a, a competition, you know, it's supposed to be. Uh, um, uh, uh, a sympathetic thing. Everyone is supposed to be sort of playing towards the same thing. Uh, the way that they arrive there is that is up to them. But uh, if I'm going here, that's where they have to go. You know, they can't go over here. You must not say it's kind of uh, odd for a guy like you, uh, so many years under your belt, the sort of experience to sort of all of a together in band and take it on the road. Um, was it a matter of like uh, having sort of peak as a solo performer in the studio? Well, it's still you know it's still my name on the marquee. <laughs> it's not a 
Uh, you're not the Fab Four. No, we're not the Fab <laughs> Fab Twelve yet, and uh, and also it's uh, you know it's, it's still me writing the material and I sing all the songs. It's uh, it's still essentially a solo thing, and I don't think the audience is yet uh, fully aware of the you know, the personalities that, that are in the band as uh, as talented as they are. That's uh, uh, mostly unfamiliar names to people. So, uh, if I continue to do this, it may, there may come a time which uh, it becomes like Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, but the band doesn't have a name now. You know, it's not like blah blah, you know, something or other band or um, the uh, possibility that it happening is is fairly remote as well because there are. Some of the people in the in the group have come from their own more or less successful uh, careers and, and are likely to go back with and continue with those. So, uh, um, in, in addition to that, I can't afford to. Uh, uh, I don't make that much money. With it. I make you know they they make a just you know, regular sort of salary, and I make just slightly more than that. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it all goes to expenses which all people on the road. I mean just the per diems alone are a large chunk. You know, hotel rooms are unbelievable. Well, I guess our interviewer is forgetting that the, the band Utopia has not been on the back for that long. That. No, and the, and there's always the possibility that that'll, you know, something will happen with that again. Uh, particularly, you know, see more likely in Japan than in the in the US. You know, we don't have a record deal in the US, but there is a lot there seems to be some interest to uh, uh, a few record companies have expressed interest in uh, financing a Utopia album. Is that right? So there's always the possibility that there will be a Utopia show. In mm. case, uh, uh, then it will be Utopia. It won't mm. be Todd Rundgren and Utopia. Mm. So what could have been that? Utopia. What are like uh, nearly doing? That could have been uh, a Utopia record or a Utopia tour? Well, it would have been Utopia plus a bunch of other people mm. and then they, you know, in order to adequately, you know, reproduce what was on the record, it would still, they would only have been three of uh, 11 people in the band. That wouldn't have been possible? Well, it's not that it wouldn't have been possible, it's, uh, it's, uh, it just wasn't important enough to do, you know, to do that, you know, to call the guys together to do that. They've got other things that they're doing. Oh, they're right. Chasm continues to play with Joan Jett and probably got paid more for that than he oh, would doing right. this, mm -hmm. because, uh, and and aside from that, if we were to do another utopia thing, this would kind of that would kind of like undercut it in a way. I think. You know? I mean, this is something that's distinctly mine, mm -hmm. and uh, and I don't think that we want to uh, 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 get a false start on it, on anything that the band might do. You know, if the band decides to get together, we want it to, we want it to have a, a a really distinct personality of its own. In working with uh, other musicians outside musicians with Tom, um, uh, did you find there was a uh, greater spontaneity of new discoveries, or was it matter, or more, was it more a matter of keeping the guys in line? Well, the uh, the method of uh, of recording sort of required a little bit of both. The arrangements were very strict. There were charts for for much of it, and. Um, and if you didn't keep, you know, if, you, if there wasn't a strong organizational hand, then it would just, you know, probably just sound like a mess. So there had to be, you know, I had to say this is what's supposed to happen, this is the effect we're trying to achieve, you know, and and, uh, and with uh, some time, you know, with as many people as we would have in the studios, you know, I, I, I would be open to, you know, like small suggestions. Somebody could say, well, could I do this here? And I would say, maybe fine. Or I'd say, no, that's not... Uh, that's not what we're trying to create. You know, it's uh, uh, it's not as if musicians all always desire just to go off and play any old thing. Um, it's as desirable as a player, you know, to have uh, uh, have somebody give you a clear and concise um, picture of what's trying to be accomplished, uh, as it is just, just somebody to come in and say, just you know, play free. You know, it's, uh, that's an invitation of disaster most times because one of two things happens. Either, you know, 
you've got people playing in, in four or five different universes, you know, or else somebody just doesn't have an idea at all. You know, they have no idea what to play. You know, so kind of sound like the art ensemble of Chicago. Yeah, it could be. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's desirable, I think, particularly if the time space is short. You know, for somebody to, to be very, uh, uh, you know, to play general, you know, and the rest of the people play troops. At the same time, you know, the general doesn't do all the fighting. You know. And everyone is. Uh, uh, a part of the concept was that that it, that uh, I give them a, sh a brief period of time so that they don't settle into just doing it, you know, same way all the time. It keeps p everyone on the edge so that there is uh, the possibility of, uh, of discovering a little something new every day. You know, everyone uh, I'm sure as they continue to play it would start to get a little bit greater understanding and uh, and uh, and. Uh, and experiment with the little nuances and ideas and, and ways to uh, uh, to take it. And if they take it too far, I let them know. And if uh, and if what they're doing works, then everybody's happy. You know? So it uh, was never a question of everyone just playing really strictly to the charts of looking like you were doing jingles or uh, uh, com commercials or something like that. Uh, part of the part of the concept was spontaneity, but uh, it, it's also uh, very. Uh, circumscribed in a way, you know, it's, uh, it's got to be appropriately spontaneous, you know, it can't just be any old thing. Hey, Mark, I don't know, it's one, one thing is very expensive. It's a lot of fun, but it's real expensive. I mean, every session has wound up in a party, that time. so it's, uh, um, it's great fun recording like that, but it's uh, terrifically expensive, and also, it, in some ways, it limits what you can do. Um, I had to write material that uh, that uh, people could grasp within that short period of time that they were allowed, since uh, it was, you know, anywhere from you know two, three, four hours from the time they first heard the song until they were still we were laying down takes. So. Uh, so part of what the album reflects is the, uh, you know, is the uh, learning experience of the, uh, of the material. And if I wanted to do anything that was particularly complicated, um, you know, in one case, in one song, I, did, I knew that it was too complicated for the uh, singers to learn it. So I had the singers come to my house the day before and talk them what they were supposed to sing or else it never would have happened. And so in that sense, uh, if I want to get more ambitious musically, then I will have to compromise the spontaneity part of it because uh, um, you can only people can only remember so much within that uh, period of time. And aside from that, I think that uh, I am uh, moving into a different compositional phase as well, mm -hmm. uh, partially because I uh, have been. Um, Working in other things, I've been working in uh, doing TV and film music, and and I wrote a musical and I'm uh, about to write another one. And these don't uh, conform to the same rules that pop music does. And in that sense, I want to uh, um, I want to, in in the context of the recording, uh, uh, try and explore some of these other things. Something that maybe a little bit more like a opera or a symphony or some, you know, some other, uh, uh, some other form that isn't uh, normally undertaken in the uh, uh, recording studio. Hmm. And you're suggesting a departure from pop music for a while? Well, I, I never intentionally mean for it not to be pop music or for it to be pop music or anything like that. I'm just, uh, my only prerequisite is, is that I, um, is that I am personally excited about doing it. You know that I feel so, that I feel I can convey some new thing, or that it's like a new area to explore. It's like going to another country for me, like coming to Japan in some ways. You know, it's uh, it's uh, I want to. Uh, I just want to see what's out there. See what's out there in that other musical territory, and uh, and see how well I function in it. And uh, 
when I start out my conceptual, um, I start with a very vague concept. Just, you know, I, I don't write music like most people, particularly pop musicians write music. I don't sit down at the piano and go, you know, you know moon, June, spring, that, you know, stuff like that. It's, uh, it, it becomes more and more for me a process of rumination, you know, uh, first of all, trying to figure out the things that truly matter to me so that I can reflect them in a musical context. Um, whereas some people think, oh, I've got this little melody here, you know, all I need is some words. That's not, that's too, uh, that, that's too ad hoc for me. I need it to be essentially, you know, have to come from a, some essential place inside me. So I, so I ruminate for months sometimes on, uh, on what I'm going to do musically before I even attempt to do it. Huh. And when it comes time to actually write the song, the song comes out very quickly. Um, and it'll be a product of, you know, a little bit of piano noodling and a lot of thought. You know, like I'll have a musical idea, and, you know, maybe a template of some kind, and I'll, and I'll work, at, work something out on the piano. But I won't actually sit, you know, feel that I'm obligated to come up with a song or a complete idea until it's time to record it. And then when it comes time to record it, then I, um, I more or less force myself to, uh, to materialize this thing. Okay. And that's often what happens in the context of a, even a record like Nearly Human. Many of the songs are just really sort of um, atoms that are just, you know, have yet to form into molecules. And, uh, and I will uh, schedule a session. You know, I'll say, well, it's time for me to take this uh, group of atoms and precipitate them into some, uh, into some, uh, some molecularly coherent thing. And I'll book the session, and that'll mean I have no choice but to do that. You know? And then within like two or three days before that, then I'll get in my little demo studio and, uh, and sit down and, and put the pieces together and come up with the words, and then there's the song. And that will take relatively little time. But that's not a true reflection of the amount of time that went into it. The time was actually that was all worked up here, trying to... Uh, trying to make my ideas uh, clarify themselves to me. In other words, it's, a lot of people say that they get a clever title and that's all you need. You know? But for me, I need something, uh, I need, need it to be more essential than that, at least nowadays. There was a time when the clever title was enough for me, too. <laughs> but, but I've written so many songs at this point that I've got to... Uh, I've got to reach deeper and deeper and deeper every time in order to come up with something that's original and meaningful for me. You did, uh, you worked on two Japanese bands, uh, mm -hmm. two different bands, which uh, seem very familiar with both of them. Mm -hmm. I think they're very contrasting. Oh yeah, they are. I, I don't, uh, I don't choose the acts that I work with on the basis of style. Um, the most important thing to me is material. You know, is that the, is that the material is uh, is honestly motivated and has a certain degree of uh, a certain degree of craft to it. You know, but craft alone is not enough. It has to be you know, it has to be original and it has to be sincerely motivated. And uh, and in that sense, it's uh, it's not. You know, that's the only similarity in terms of all the acts that I produce. You're approaching working with them rather different. Well, it's got to be different because I don't uh, understand the lyrics. <laughs> uh, Not because the two bands are really important. Oh yeah, well, they you know one band was a pro performing band. Uh -huh. You know, they were you know strictly uh, you know, their strongest suit was their live performance, and the other act was uh, he was a singer songwriter. And although he performed live, he, he really uh, was much more studio oriented. You know, like, um, had very you know elaborately worked out demos and things like that. And, could, and as a matter of fact, he used uh, sequencers and, and then synthesizers. And he would come in with the you know the entire album on a disc. <laughs> and, you know, so we just couldn't we'd essentially worry about what kind of sounds he wanted. And things like that. Um, but the uh, you know most important thing for me is is that I have to like the material. But the, the style of the material is not important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 
after having worked with work, having, after having worked with you, was quite contrasting as well with performing bands. Uh, that it was a you know a real joy, a, a real party to work with you. Whereas the singer songwriter says uh, you would have put him through these uh, promotions. Uh, it was a real well, it, harrowing it, experience. Well, it was harrowing. For, it was harrowing for him because um, he was uh, used to doing things a certain way, and uh, and. I insisted that he do things in a different way. Um, the reason being that um, was because of the emphasis that I placed on material. And he was used to, to not doing a lot of demos and just coming in and kind of generating the album on the fly. And I, uh, and I want to know beforehand that we've got an album's worth of material mm -hmm. before we start, you know, so that, so that we're not... Uh, so that we don't have any anxiety somewhere down the line, you know, that perhaps, you know, this that this is not going to turn out to be as strong as we want. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really let him start until he had, you know, a substantial amount of material already written and demoed out, you know, and still, all during the course of it, you know, I was kind of, you know, nagging him to, you know, to, uh, you know, to complete these ideas, to get these ideas in a more coherent form before we uh, lay them down. So uh, I think it was m more nerve it was more nerve wracking for him because he was used to just kind of coming in and having it uh, uh, be a very cut and dried experience. But that's you know you never know what somebody needs to make a you know to make a record happen. You know, in that particular case, that's what needed to happen. Hopefully the end result is is uh, hopefully the end result is the same, which is the best record they can make. Uh, for some people, they c they come in and, and and the best record they can make is something very close to what they would do if they were on stage, uh, which is the case of uh, of uh, bands like uh, Lapiche. And if they uh, and if they get too self conscious in the studio, then they don't sound as good. You know? But uh, um, that's part of what being a producer is. You know, is trying to. Uh, Trying to see what the strengths are, you know, and, uh, and play to play to a particular amount of strength. And uh, and even though it's uh, even though I think it was more difficult for him, you know, I don't think it was. Uh, uh, some of the best albums that I've made have been you know, difficult experiences. Skylarking, you know, one of the reasons why he wanted me to produce this album in the first place was was from a personality standpoint nearly a nightmare. You know. Then again, it was the most successful album the band had ever had. <clears throat> okay.